So the Lord God said to the snake, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from food from it and all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Well, what is wrong with the world? If you opened uh, the paper this week or watched the news, you might have seen the following headlines. Uh, Oil tanker attacks in the Persian Gulf. Hospital patients die from an outbreak uh, outbreak of Listeria from sandwiches. Muslim gangs in prisons uh, beat uh, those who won't convert to Islam. The High Court throws out a case uh, to have an MP face charges about lying about Brexit. Another MP admits to cocaine use. Sally Challens, uh, her murder conviction of her husband uh, was reduced to manslaughter after a court found she suffered 40 years of coercive control. We read about these things day after day, year after year, and you've got to think to yourself, this is a crazy, mixed up, broken world where people lie, cheat, embezzle money, gossip, slander, hatred and anger are rife, sexual immorality. People are just trying to take what they can and they don't care about who they hurt as long as they get what they want. It is a crazy, broken world. But let's make it more personal. What is wrong with your world? It might be loneliness, depression. You might have been terribly hurt by someone. You might be suffering a broken relationship. It might be that you are arrogant and proud. What is wrong with your world? Because this is how the world is. And this is the world we see in Genesis chapter 3. And we need to understand this chapter or the rest of the Bible will make no sense whatsoever and your life will make no sense. Today is like a trip to the doctor. We are experiencing symptoms. We need to get the diagnosis so we can look for the cure. Small groups are going to pick up further on uh, many questions that I'm not going to answer in today's sermon. Um, Do discuss them. There's been great conversations in small groups. If you're not in one, join one, because you're going to dig deep even further into God's Word. But if you do have questions, do email me this week or email a John, and uh, one of the Johns, and we'll try and answer those questions. But if you do get Genesis 3 then you will be able to make sense of this crazy mixed-up world and why it is the way it is. We're going to see today that this is how the world is and this is how the world should be. 
but wonderfully, this is not how the world will always be. And you need to ask yourself, as we look at the text of Genesis 3, is this too pessimistic? Is it too optimistic? Or is this realistic? Why is the world like this? Well, the world is like this because humans have rebelled against our Creator, the God we saw in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, who made everything, and he made it and looked at it and said, it is very good. We saw last week that humans disobeyed the instruction God gave them not to eat the fruit of just one tree. They could eat anything apart from the fruit of this one tree. And the buck passing starts. They disobey, and so Adam passes the buck. He blames Eve. Eve blames the snake, and the snake doesn't have a leg to stand on. But also, and perhaps surprisingly, the world is like it is today because of God. God has put this world under judgment. Look at verse 15. The Lord God said, I will. Look at verse 16. God said, I will. Verse 17. God said, because you did this, I will. Or verse 22 to 24. God drove them out of the garden. See, the same God who spoke and created everything and said it was very good now speaks a word of judgment, first upon the snake, then the woman, and then the man. Let's have a look. Verse 14, a word of judgment on the snake. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Satan or the devil, is here in the form of a snake. The, Bible tells, the rest of the Bible tells us that this is referring to Satan. God's judgment on him is one of total humiliation, crawling on his belly. He'll be the lowest of the low, eating dust. He's despised. And the book of Revelation in the Bible tells us that the Satan is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Satan has not managed to topple the king of heaven and earth. This is how the world is. And we experience the existence of evil in the world every day because God has arranged a constant conflict with humans and the devil. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, snakes are scary, especially when you're in the New South Wales outback, hundreds of miles away from a hospital that carries any anti-venom. And when you come face to face with a king brown snake, which rears its head right up in front of yours, they are scary. But history shows us that there is a scarier snake. There's been constant conflict between humans and the devil. But God promises in verse 15 that the conflict will one day end. One of Eve's offspring will crush the devil, but in the process, they will be wounded themselves. We're going to come back to that towards the end. God curses the devil and now punishes the humans for their rebellion. Look at verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. The punishment for the woman goes to the heart of her uniqueness as a woman. Now, I witnessed the birth of my two children, and that was painful enough for me. I don't know what it would have been like for my wife. Many of the women here know all too well those pains. But some also know the pain of not being able to conceive or, the, or to lose a child in the womb. Verse 16, with painful labor, you will give birth to children. 
But this could also refer to the bringing up of children, the painful labor of giving birth for hours, days, the exasperating effort of raising toddlers and bringing up children. And the pain will be in marriage as well. Your desire will be for your husband. Not a good desire, but a desire to control or to be against. A desire for the woman to wear the trousers. Or could it be a desire for a perfect husband like Adam was in Genesis chapters 1 and 2? A looking for Mr. Perfect, Mr. Right, a longing and a looking that will never be fulfilled. And the husband will rule over the wife. Not a good ruling over, but a domineering, a ruling badly, a leading thoughtlessly. See, the love and cherish becomes desire and dominate. Adam and Eve were like uh, the ballroom dancers working together. Now they both have two left feet and they're both trying to lead. And it's a battle of the sexes. And we know in our existence the exploitation of the sexes as well. Think of the cultures who make it law for women to go outside dressed head to toe, covered, and following their husbands at a distance. Think of our culture, which parades uh, particularly women around in bare flesh and traffics them here and there. But even if you aren't married or have no children, you'll still know pain living and working in this world. So in verse 17, God turns to Adam and he says, Because you listened to your wife, God holds Adam responsible, and ate, from, ate fruit from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Now notice the offense was to eat the wrong thing. Now the judgment is that eating will be hard. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. God says, Adam, from now on, you will only get food on the table by painful work, hard work, not the wonderful good work of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 3 says it will be hard work, painful toil. One commentator says, whatever our work, we now earn our crust amidst broken machinery, workplace politics, failed deliveries, repetitious boredom, crashing computers, jammed photocopiers, late trains, missed appointments, crossed wires, and all the other irritations which put sweat on our shirts each day. God doesn't just randomly choose family and work as areas that are affected but they were chosen because it mirrors what was so good in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Remember God said they were to be fruitful and increase in number, and now that process will have pain. The woman was to be the man's helper, and now that relationship will have pain. They were to work the garden, and now work will have pain. And the pain doesn't stop there. Pain will continue in verse 19 until death. Until we return to the ground, since from it we were taken, for dust we are, and to dust we will return. And these words are said over everyone who has a funeral. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Death is decreation, the undoing of creation. Now, I've lost count how many funerals I've taken as a vicar, but each one is a sobering reminder of the realities that these verses speak about. Death is a reminder of the rebellion humans mounted against the good God 
who created them. This is how the world is. This is our reality. And we all know something of it because the things we're speaking about are the things that we see and feel and experience each and every day. But it doesn't end there. We haven't heard the worst yet. We need to note one more thing. Because in case man tries to reach out his hand in verse 22 and take also from the tree of life and therefore live forever, Man is expelled from paradise. Humans are banished from the Garden of Eden. They're kicked out. They're forcibly removed. Like a spectator who runs onto a, a sporting field and is quickly detained by security and evicted because they've uh, not complied with the entry policy. Adam is removed with his wife from the garden because he has disobeyed and not listened to the voice of his creator. God is so serious that in verse 24, he says, After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, if you're a keeny, over lunch, look up Exodus chapter 26, verse 31, and see what is embroidered on the curtain in the temple, separating the most holy place from the rest of the temple, and you join the dots yourself. But what a tragedy. Kicked out of the garden, and it is guarded so they cannot return to eat from the tree of life. What a tragedy. Humans trying to gain so much but we actually lose everything. It's like the story of a gambler who was not satisfied with winning millions, but bet one more time and lost everything. Because of these events, that is why no human being who has ever been born is in a right relationship with God. We need to understand this point this morning. If you are not a Christian yet, then please don't think your life will pan out in the end. You mustn't think God is totally okay with your life and lifestyle, and therefore one day you'll stroll through the pearly gates of heaven and introduce yourself to Almighty God. Please don't listen to that delusion. Genesis 3 now tells us that without even trying, because we are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, our spiritual status is total separation from God. There is no one in the right with God. We, by nature, are objects of wrath. That is what the Bible says. So how can we fix the world? How can we fix it? We can't. No one can get back to God by their own efforts. The Garden of Eden is lost. We have been shut out. And the soundtrack to our lives, I will do it my way, becomes a song of utter folly. Genesis 3 tells us we live in a world which is broken because we broke it and we cannot fix it. Everywhere we look, we see a reminder of this reality. And it's a good reminder that as summer approaches, there is no such thing as the perfect holiday. Yeah, let's pray for refreshment and time with family and friends, but don't expect it to be perfect. Pray for your children taking exams, but don't expect education to provide the silver bullet for their lives. Pray for good health and healing, but remember we live in a Genesis 3 world of decay and death. 
Pray to be useful at work on Monday, but don't expect it to be plain sailing. There will be frustrations. Pray that this week, God will show you in everything that you do, you are living in a Genesis 3 world, no longer a Genesis 1 and 2 world, which was very good. This is how the world is, and this is how the world should be. But wonderfully, wonderfully, this is not how the world will always be. Genesis chapter 3 tells us against the backdrop of such a devastating picture of the paradise which has been lost, we still see God's great love for the world he made, but the world which turned its back on its creator. See, God is not done with Adam and Eve yet. He could have wrapped things up in Genesis chapter 3. If you've got your Bible there, just flick over the pages and praise God that he continues to speak to us. God persists with sinful people, and the rest of the Bible is testimony to that. So let's look at the glimpses of God's love in these verses of, of chapter 3. Look at verse 15. There is an announcement of the one who will defeat evil. Someone will crush Satan's head. Verse 20. Adam then names Eve, which means life. Even after receiving the curse of death, he names his wife life. Now I take this as possibly an expression of Adam's trust in the promise of verse 15. The promise of God to send someone who will fix what we cannot fix. He knows his sin and he responds with repentance and faith. He ate from the tree that God said not to eat from. And now God curses them and he is filled with grief and remorse. But he hears God's word of promise. And he names his wife Eve, which means life. And in verse 21, God punishes. But he graciously takes a life to cover their shame. And now in 2019, we stand in the privileged position to see how God did send the serpent crusher. And we read in Matthew's gospel, the angel telling Joseph, you will, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And we see that Jesus went to the cross to take the guilt and shame of our sins away and to clothe us in his image again. And so we will be allowed to walk beside our maker in the new heavens and earth. And you need to ask yourself, is Genesis chapter 3, is it too pessimistic? Is it too optimistic? Or is this reality? I honestly think, and in many conversations this past week, that many of us are too optimistic about our sin, too pessimistic about God's free gift of new life in Christ. But here is the reality in Genesis chapter 3. Yes, it should make us grieve our sin. We should weep at our pride and our arrogance and rebellion against the God who made us and our inability to fix the problem ourselves. But then it should cause us to point to Jesus as the only one who can fix our deepest problem, the deepest problem of this world, us. And this is what will help us groan with hope when we experience yet another imperfect day in this world. It will make us stand on tippy toes and long for the day when Jesus returns and those who have had their guilt and shame taken away and been clothed with the righteousness that he gives 
will be able to reach out and take from the tree of life and live with God forever. You see, there's a great promise in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. We see a picture of the future made possible because Jesus has crushed Satan at the cross. And it is a picture of paradise regained. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its tr uh, fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb Jesus will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and they will live with him forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.